All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Um, I'm Stephen Warner with Lawn Buddy, and this is Going Green. Um, tonight, I have a very special guest and a really good friend, Austin Oaks. Austin, thank you so much for, for joining me tonight. Thanks for having me. Great to be with you all. So um, most of our viewers tonight are all in the lawn and landscape um, industry. Um, so we can kind of start there. Can you walk us through um, the role you play um, in your in your companies and then also just the general overview of the, the companies that you run? Absolutely. So I am the CEO of actually two different companies. Uh, our first company is called Electrex. We are a wiring harness assembly manufacturer, and we actually build wiring harnesses for the turf, construction, ag, uh, service industries. And uh, we've been doing that for 43 years uh, at Electrex. And then we also have a second company called Seat King. Seat King is about 10 years old, and so we build industrial seats uh, primarily for the turf industry. So uh, between electrics and Seat King, if you're on a Hustler, a Bad Boy, Grasshopper, Toro, John Deere, MTD, Walker, uh, if you're sitting on any of those kinds of products, there's a good chance you're on one of our seats or they're being powered by one of our wiring harnesses. That's awesome. The, uh, and uh, I know your background and I know you very well, um, and I know that you have a very kingdom-centered business. Could you elaborate on, on that and then talk to us about the manufacturing process because I know it's really unique and then ultimately how your products get into the, the user's hands. Absolutely. So uh, for us, um, you know, purpose is everything. You hear that a lot. And so for us, um, the why that drives us is why are we in business? Why do we do this? And for us, it, it comes down to three things. We talk about the purpose of business being for economic, social, and spiritual capital. So economics, everybody understands it's money in your pocket. Your business has to have it to, to stay alive individually as employees or owners. You've got to have it to keep your family healthy. Right. And so we believe that's important. Uh, we go a step further than that, though, and we think there's two other important elements of that. One is social capital. And we define social capital as everything money can't buy. Right. So you can work for our business. You can take home a huge paycheck. But if you don't like the people you work with and the culture and environment you work in, uh, taking home a big paycheck isn't necessarily worth it, right? So we believe that's important too. The third thing that we think is important is what we call spiritual capital. And we define that as having a purpose greater than yourself. And so uh, you can have a great job. You can make a lot of money. You can have a lot of friends. Uh, I know a lot of professional athletes, they have those things. Uh, but even Tom Brady, after he won his fourth, fifth, sixth championship, goes, there's got to be something more. And uh, we believe in that, too. And so um, we believe economic, social and spiritual capital are kind of the three bedrocks of what drives us. And so um, specifically how that gets applied in our business, we're kind of second chance people. We believe that everybody deserves a second chance, including myself sometimes. And so uh, we have a unique situation where part of our labor force is actually inside a maximum security prison. Um, and so these guys experience economic, social, and spiritual capital benefits inside our company. So they make um, full uh, wages that would be equivalent to what they would make on the outside. That's their economic benefit. Every day when they show up, they get to be part of a team. They get to be a part of a purpose. They, they are some of the most passionate guys I've seen about building seats that the industry has never seen before. And so. Uh, that social bond binds them really close. And then ultimately, we encourage them that God's created them for much bigger purpose than just to have a job. And so uh, especially when they're in prison and they've they've been kind of at the bottom of that barrel, so to speak, um, they they all of a sudden when they have a job and they they get to be a part of a team, they see life as having much more meaning than it may have held before. And so that's a great part of um, our team and, and what we do. And it, it's a blessing to those guys, but it's a blessing to us because they're, they're some of the greatest and best workers that we have. And they're passionate about creating economic, social and spiritual capital inside not only our businesses, but our communities as well, inside their local community. So uh, there's some great things that happen from that. And so we're prim primarily a OEM provider. Um, and so really our customer, the people that buy the majority of seats from us are those OEMs that I, I mentioned previously, but we also have a retail site as well called lawnmowerseats.com. And so if you're looking for a replacement lawnmower seat, 
um, there's a place where you can go and, and buy an unbranded seat directly from us. Yep, and, and that is fantastic. I'm a huge believer in second chances as well. I mean, this industry, a lot of our folks, um, it's full of men and women who are starting a business um, and they, they get that second chance through the long landscape industry. Um, and so that's gigantic. I know um, you guys had a huge um, segment in the Global Leadership Summit last year um, highlighting that. I know we just um, passed it, but uh, thank you for everything that you guys do um, in doing that. Um, it's, it's You can really feel the culture of your company just by talking to you or even going to your website. Um, and then talking about you specifically, Austin, is that you have a huge role when it comes to thinking creatively, um, that research and development mindset um, and uh, so can you talk us through kind of the, the research and development and what you may have on the roadmap for this year to stay out ahead um, of the industry? I know 2020 is a, a very interesting and challenging year, but uh, diamonds are made when you apply heat and pressure. Uh, and I'm sure your, your seats can take some heat and pressure too. Absolutely. So uh, new products R&D is actually a big passion of mine. And uh, so I, I personally have sometimes one and maybe two hands involved in it, but uh, I, I personally love it. And I think for our business, it actually is crucial too. And so it's been fun this year. We've released uh, two different seats um, that really um, offer an OEM, a lot more customization options, but it also op uh, offers offer operator comfort and a level of serviceability in seats. Uh, that is pretty new to the market. And so those seats are, are hitting uh, this year as they go to OEMs. And so we're pretty excited about that as well. You know, I think uh, innovation is a big piece of um, what we do at Seeking and our value proposition. And uh, we, we're really excited about some of the products that uh, we have in the roadmap and, and where we'll be going in the future. That's awesome. I, uh, I firmly believe that the only thing more comfortable than my lazy boy um, is one of your seats. Um, and uh, especially some of the designs that you've made, they are um, very amazing and, uh, and interesting. Uh, you walked the floor at GIE last year um, and you get to point out a lot of your seats. Yeah. Um, and I was just kind of blown away. So um, make sure you guys check out their, uh, their website and go uh, see it for yourself. Uh, Cause it really is amazing. You could call it technology, it's technology, it's seat technology, I suppose, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, talking about innovation is always a, a passion of mine, and I know it's a passion of yours, and our industry is changing rapidly. Uh, I mean, you look left and right, and there's an autonomous mower, there's a, a mower called the spider that goes up the side of hills. Um, I, I feel like there's an innovation that's finally happening in the industry, and kind of Talk through where you think the industry is going and where you see some innovations emerging in the long landscape industry. Absolutely. So, you know, what's interesting. I don't mean this as a slight to the industry at all, but I, I think it's actually is where the opportunity is. I think that the turf industry has been behind the curve uh, probably by 15 or 20 years, you know, maybe to the automotive industry, which you could say is probably more at the tip of the spear a little bit. A lot of the technologies and um, the, the things that you see in the automotive world are slowly making their way more so into the turf industry. And so I think that's where a lot of the opportunity is. I think that's where you're going to continue to see the integration of technology, the kind of the soft side integrated with the physical side. And I think that's uh, for us, as we think about seats in particular, the seat itself is a very physical thing. And we're adding, you know, what we would describe as technology to that seat that, that is physical in terms of uh, water, uh, uh, water, how we keep water out, the water principles to that seat, the airflow of that seat, the comfort of that seat, the materials that are used in that seat. Uh, we actually have physical technologies that we're implying into those seats, but there's also this actual soft side of the technology that's getting applied. And so as you think about it, um, we're really working on the whole operator experience. Part of that's the comfort side and the materials themselves, the longevity of that seat. But part of it's the technology that, uh, that goes around the operator experience, which is, is part of the seat, 
but it's going to be some of the technology that, that happens when you sit in that seat. Uh, the comfort, the resistance to the terrain, the suspension. Um, we've got a couple other things we're working on too to make that operator experience uh, something that's much, much better. Yeah. The, uh, and I know for the men and women who, uh, who sit in those seats all day, um, you are right when uh, um, they are, are, are wanting more and more advancements in technology, um, specifically with their equipment, right? So I would agree with you that it's about 15 to 20 years behind, which is one of the reasons why um, we identified the long landscape industry as one to address um, by enabling the small and medium-sized business owners with technology. And I think we're finally seeing the technology catch up. Um, and uh, luckily, all of your uh, your customers are literally along for the ride um, in your seat. So uh, I told you there'd be dad jokes sprinkled in here. So the uh, um, but how do you think some of those innovations will change how uh, the business owners operate um, or um, how they deliver their services, so to speak? Yes, great question. I see it really in three major ways, and I think all three of these are super important um, as, as you have small and medium-sized companies that are operating there. One, and, and we, we hear this more and more, especially through GIE over the last couple of years, the health side is, is really a key thing. I mean, when you're sitting in that machine, when you're sitting on that seat for 8, 10, 12 hours a day, uh, you have to ask yourself, what are the health implications to this, right? And so we've heard just from a, we want, you know, back to the social spiritual capital piece. We want people who, when they get done mowing all day long, they've got the energy to get out of a seat and play with their kids at the end of the day, right? I mean, there's some, there's some benefits um, outside of the job and there's benefits inside the job, including uh, reduction of in injuries, uh, health concerns, um, I think there's going to see huge improvements and benefits when it comes to the overall health of the operator as we continue to improve that technology. I think the second thing is a cost savings piece. It's going to make those companies more successful in terms of their bottom lines. Uh, the integration of technology into products, I think, has real quantitative value. Um, primarily, information at your fingertips helps you make the best decisions. We are seeing this on the wiring harness side. Um, just very simply, there are smart harnesses and there are what we call quote unquote dumb harnesses. There are harnesses that just do the job with no technology or information transfer at all. And we're seeing more and more machines adopt that smart harness technology. And so uh, how people capture that information and then how they ultimately can see it and use it in their experience with that equipment is gonna have real, I think, real cost savings and benefits to, uh, to you all and your businesses. So that's super exciting. I think the third one is just an enjoyment and a ultimately what leads to creativity. You know, when you think about being on those machines, there's a basic functionality to it, but uh, we want it to be an enjoy enjoyable process as well. And so we think if it's enjoyable, if you enjoy that machine, if you enjoy sitting in it and using the technology at your fingertips, um, there's something beautiful about a freshly cut lawn. You know, you just, you want to kind of get out of your machine and you want to, you want to observe it. It's something about a baseball field when you look at the creativity and the ways in which they cut it and stripe the lawn. Uh, we want everybody to have that kind of enjoyment and pride and creativity as they use their machines, uh, whether it's for their lawn or for somebody else's. And so I think there's some real enjoyment and creativity that's going to come out of the technology improvements as well. Yeah, and uh, we see that every single day as well. We see I mean, we have fully electric, electric lawnmowers coming out now. Um, and even going back to your piece, one thing that uh, um, we take into consideration a lot as well is back to the health aspect. Because there are long-term effects to you sitting in that seat um, or you're out in those weather conditions all day long, um, heat stroke is a very real thing, um, especially for the, the folks that are mowing lawns in the, the, the southern areas. Um, and it's just great that the industry is catching up with innovation to really cater to what a lot of people think of as a, almost like a secondhand industry is what we run into is um, a lot of business owners are taken less seriously in the lawn landscape category, but that's starting to change. The perception is starting to change. You're seeing that it's more of an established career that you can make a lifelong company or career out of. And 
we're just very excited to be in this industry right now with all the changes that are happening. But I know this isn't your first rodeo. You've been around um, for, for a while now. And so what are some innovations besides lawn buddy that you've seen um, in the lawn and landscape industry in your own career? Hmm. You know, uh, I think it, ca it carries on to the conversation we've already had, but I even think um, the OEMs in the last four or five years, there was a push from the OEM perspective towards uh, cost reductions overall. I think if you look at the prices of new machines over the last four or five years, those have come down. And while there's benefits to that, uh, you know, we, we all like to get a good deal. Um, I think in some ways that's hurt uh, innovation and it's hurt some of those OEM brands. And so I think what we're seeing is we're seeing the pendulum swing back and uh, we see more and more OEMs who are thinking about ride quality, comfort to the operator. Um, they have a much more uh, bigger focus and a, and a more focused focus on innovation and how they're trying to make that experience better. I think you see that even from the owners, right? What's interesting is you have the OEM who really makes the decision on the quality of the machine, the suspension of the machine, the quality and size and comfort of the seat. They build it, right? But then you actually have the purchaser, the owner usually of those organizations. They may or may not be the guy that sits in the seat every day. So you have the end users who oftentimes are the third kind of person down in that spectrum who actually use and experience the seat every day. I think you're seeing more of an alignment from the OEM, the purchaser of the machine, and the user of the machine in terms of what they value and how innovation drives that value. And so um, the suspensions, the seats, there's some things there that I think actually have real tangible benefit to the human health of the operator. And as we get more and more alignment there, I think that's going to be a pretty, pretty amazing thing. That's a, that's a fantastic answer. The there's a there's an old saying my father uh, used to tell me all the time uh, that I know he didn't coin, but uh, it's buy it nice or buy it twice. And I think we're we're starting to shift back to that. I know a lot of our users have um, either learned that lesson or, or have thankfully avoided it, um, and really taking into consideration not only the quality of the, the equipment that they're purchasing, um, but also the effect that it's going to have uh, long term on themselves. Uh, and ultimately, if you're if you're having a more efficient um, work day, um, you're offsetting that with technology and equipment. Then that means you're going to spend more quality time at home, less time worrying about sending bills out, and more more time uh, chasing after kids and um, going out to the lake or whatever else you enjoy. To all, do. all the things that money can't buy. Exactly. Right. The uh, it goes back to your second principle. So, um, but with that. Um, where where have you learned how how to think or the think strategically or that process that mindset that you put yourself in um, that continuously puts you out ahead of the pack and something I learned from you continuously um, and be able to take advantage of these innovations that are coming in or even adapt them to your own business. You, you know, it's funny. Um, I definitely think I've learned some of it along the way, and a lot of it's been trial and error. You know, I do think. You know, you kind of have the innovator die, grow or die kind of mentality, right? And I think any of us who have been in a business setting at all, you kind of learn, hey, we, the way we were yesterday was the win for yesterday. And today and tomorrow are going to be different unless we, we do something different, right? And so there's definitely been an experience piece of that. Um, I'm, I'm, I think I'm wired that way a little bit too, just naturally. Um, you know, I, I don't know if anybody has ever looked at a personality test called the Enneagram. But uh, are you familiar with that at all? Oh, do you know what number you are? Um, I'd have to go back and pull it. I, I can't remember exactly what it is. Um, you might not want to disclose it to everybody, but I, I'll disclose that I'm a number one on the Enneagram. And what I love about it is it shows kind of nine stages of health. And when you are an unhealthy you in that personality, um, it, it shows you the negative consequences that you can have on other people. And when you're living on, on the healthy side, it also shows you uh, really where your unique gifts are. And so for me, I'm a number one, which um, can negatively be labeled as a perfectionist. Um, if you look on some of the other Enneagram labels, it will label it as an improver. And I like to think of myself as an improver, not a perfectionist, right? And so I'm the guy who can get a new cell phone 
And within like 30 minutes, I can come up with 20 ways in which they could have improved it and made it better. Um, you know, in, in, a, in a bad stage, I'm probably discontent with my purchase. In a good stage, I want to, you know, call Apple or whoever and say, hey, I've got some really good ideas for you. So, you know, I think a little bit of that is some of that we're wired it that way, um, which I think also speaks to the benefit of having a good team. You know, I mean, um, not all of us are the same. We bring different benefits and gifts to the team. And uh, if you're not wired that way, I think to have someone wired that way, we actually and everybody in our company, when we do on uh, actually hiring before the onboarding process, um, during hiring stage, we actually give people that Enneagram test uh, so that we can try to balance our teams the right way. Yeah, and I know there's there's a bunch of tests out there like that as well. I, I'm part of a uh, um, CEO's organization based in the Midwest that uh, um, does a lot of this training. Um, this one is a cultural index, um, but they're super important, especially when you're going through and you're making those hires. Um, and there's um, there's a fantastic book called Traction, and the second book with it is Rocket Fuel, I believe, but it talks about. Have, have you read those books? I have, yeah, great books. Yeah, so in a highly time, recommended. Yeah, very, very highly recommended. It really kind of transformed the my mindset around trying to find an implementer, right? So a, a driver to come in and execute. So you can. The, it also kind of like what you said back to that test is it shows you what you're really good at and potentially what your, your downfalls can be. And uh, a lot of times when you look at the um, the visionary or the caster or the person out there that's finding the ideas, you get really bogged down with the actual execution of, of getting it done or implementation of that process. Um, and uh, I've been very blessed to surround myself with um, people who are smarter than me that uh, have different complementary um, complementing traits um, to really push everything forward. Um, but uh, 100% agree with you on that. Yeah. The uh, um, so with that, do you have any words of wisdom that you could pass on to our users from from your experience or anyone watching? Yeah, you know, I think I just encourage everybody right now. Um, I think one of the wonderful things about the United States is that if you've got a vision and a dream and you've got hard work um, and you've got uh, a willingness to stay in the grind, you can be successful, right? I mean, Stephen, you're a great example of that. Your company, how you've started it and grown it. Um, Seat King was really a startup for us as well. And so uh, we, we've lived that and been a part of that dream. I think what's interesting is, um, I don't know if, if people are familiar with, uh, I think it's Seth Godin is his name. And uh, he actually talks about the emotional cycle of change. And he actually has a nice little graph where you start out thinking, man, this is gonna be awesome, right? I, I have this idea, it's gonna be great. We're gonna make a lot of money. This company is gonna be successful, whatever that idea is. And then all of a sudden, as you get day two, three, four, five, six, you get into it through, things that happen outside of the business and probably things that happen inside the business, all of a sudden you come to that conclusion that you have an informed pessimism. You realize that those lofty thoughts that you had, you know, there's actually bills to pay and taxes to pay and, and people who aren't getting along and you hired the wrong people. There's a, there's a world pandemic. I mean, there's all those things that fall out of the sky and you're at the bottom of that dip and he calls it the Valley of despair. And, I think that is a natural place that we all end up, whether you own a business, you run a business, you've got a family, whatever the circumstance is, I think you wind up in that valley of despair. And I think as people are studying and looking at this, I think that's why we talk about the why and, and what you believe and what internally motivates you as compared to what externally motivates you. And you've got to stick in it. And it's, it's that persistence and um, willingness to not quit. We talk a lot that, that ultimately the way you win is by what we call winning by attrition. It means everybody else quits, right? It's not that you necessarily have to be the fastest in this race that we're running, but it means that you can't be the guy that, that taps out first. And uh, I, I just think today, uh, you know, business and life is a full contact sport and, um, it can be hard, it can be abusive. I mean, business can have you on your knees and in tears, right? I mean, there's some hard parts to it. There's a lot of greatness and a lot of rewards that come from it. 
But I think even right now, just the encouragement to anybody who's watching this and as you think about what is 2020 for us, um, there's a lot of challenges that go with life and business in general. Uh, we're probably all together in our, in our world, we're in a valley of despair right now. Um, I even think about just kind of the political situation, the, the financial stability of the US, uh, the pandemic ramifications, there, you know, the racial tensions that we feel in our country. There are so many things that seem to be bringing us to the, to the center of that valley of despair right now. And so, you know, I just, my two encouragements for everybody would be number one, hold fast to that thing which, which motivates you. Whatever your why is, you've got to stick with that why and it's got to internally drive you. And secondarily would be just don't quit, right? I think uh, you are a lot tougher and stronger than you may feel or think in the moment. And, uh, you know, just hang on because tomorrow the sun's gonna rise, it's gonna be a new day. And at some point you get out of that valley of despair, which is to what he calls informed uh, optimism, right? And you realize, hey, we're gonna be okay. Things are gonna be okay. And so uh, that's ultimately where success ultimately eventually ends up. And so I just encourage everybody, if you're in that spot today where you are feeling kind of in the valley of despair, um, hang tight because it's, it's going to get better. Yeah, that's, uh, that was fantastic. Whenever you decide to run for political office, I, I, I've got your back. All right. So, I'll, I'll, you'll be the first to know. You can be my campaign manager. Perfect. 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 The, uh, no, that was really good. I, I heard some Seth Godin in there and some uh, Simon Sinek um, sprinkled in there, too. The uh, um, uh, Start With Why and uh, what was the name of the Seth Godin book you were talking about? You know, I don't even know the name of the book. Well, I'm just going to research Seth Godin because he has a bunch. Throw, throw it on there when you figure it out. The, uh, I'll put it in the comments below as soon as we uh, we get that for you. But kind of back to one of my, my favorite questions that I like to, to ask folks um, that come on, uh, especially towards the end, is uh, one of the things I truly enjoy to do is read and listen to, to books and just continue to seek knowledge. I think that the, the books or audiobooks you listen to won't hold the keys to your success, but they can help shape. Um, what that key ultimately looks like. Um, are there any good books that you've read this year? Oh man, you you would pop this one on me. I, I, I put it, put you on the spot. <laughs> you know, I I read continually, and probably part of the problem is I read too much. Um, you know, nothing is coming. I'm trying to think of what. Uh, well, when was when, when did you read Traction? Traction is a good one. When, when was the last time you read that? It's uh, it's been a couple years, but we we implemented a lot of the principles. We're not probably an officially traction driven organization, but we implemented a lot of the uh, good best practices from that book. Yeah, that that book is uh, is fantastic. I read it a couple years ago too, and we didn't go through. If you decide to read it, um, there's what they call the EOS operating system, entrepreneurial operating system. I think is what they call it, um, which is surprise software. Um, but uh, you don't have to use that because you already have mom, buddy. Um, but the principles that are inside of that book are fantastic. And then it also leads into the second book called, there's two or three books. Um, but I think the next one is called Rocket Fuel, um, which is really good. It's a fantastic book that I read last year and had my staff um, read. And then another one um, that I had our staff read is uh, Simon Sinek's new Infinite Game, um, yes. which um, kind of talk. Have you have you seen that book? I have. I've I've heard good things about it. I haven't read it. Yeah. But, the, uh, I think uh, it's uh, as a, as a thank you for for coming on, I'll have to send you a, a copy. The um, there's a there's a lot of different things that he goes around with that. Um, but uh, fantastic. It's your frame of mind. It, it talks about a lot of what you you said in your last question as far as your frame of mind. Um, and how you think your process is. I think I actually read an article. It wasn't the book, but I read an article that was kind of a summary. He was in Inc. Magazine or something. I think it was kind of a, a promo article for the book, and I read that, and I think I think we aligned very much to that in terms of our value system and how we operate it. Uh, it did bring to mind uh, one of my favorite books that I read this last year. It's been a while since I read it, but it's called The Like Switch. Have you ever heard of The Like Switch? I have. Um, it's a great book on how to connect and be more dynamic in relationships with people. And uh, I really, really would recommend it. Yeah, I'll check that out. 
I'll, I'll, I'll get it. But uh, um, Austin, I know we're, we're rounding up on our, our time for today, but uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much for, for jumping on. Thank you so much for letting our users know a little bit about your company, um, your culture, and your, your manufacturing process and how you ultimately get your products to OEM and into um, the business owner's hands. I truly appreciate everything you do, um, not only um, here in Wichita, but also for the, the industry. Well, I guess technically right outside of Wichita, we work for plenty of That's right. We call it Wichita too. So yeah, thank you for having me on and just uh, blessings to everybody. Uh, you know, it's an interesting season and, and uh, we wish the best for everybody. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll put the links below. Um, if you have any questions, be sure, um, type them out, we'll get to you. Um, either someone got to you beforehand or we'll get to you right after this. And if you have any questions for Austin you want us to follow up with, um, type those out as well and we will get to them. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in and we will see you next time on Going Green with Lombardy.